Welcome back, folks. This is um, Joint Justice Oversight. I was going to say House Corrections and House Corrections. Oversight Committee. It is August 28th, and we're picking up from this morning. We are running a little late this morning, and we're starting off this afternoon with what was scheduled at 11.30, dealing with some updates from DOC, particularly the Medicaid waiver, that's the 11.15 waiver detaining population and any other updates they want to give us. I know that Ashley Berliner um, is the Director of Medicaid Policy for DIVA. She's um, not able to come in this afternoon. Um, she was available at 1130, but we just want to take time for this testimony. So we will reschedule her for our September meeting, which we haven't scheduled yet. Um, but Isaac, you're here for DOC, so I'll start with you. And if you can introduce yourself, other folks who may have that with you. Thank you. I'm Isaac Daniel, the policy director at the department. Viva Tabba, I'm the executive director of health, wellness, and engagement at DOC. Thank you. So welcome. So where do you want to start? 1115 waiver? Yeah, I think we can you know, briefly overview the 1115 waiver process, um, which I think some folks will be familiar with a bit from conversations in the previous session. Um, and then, of course, I think maybe in a future joint justice meeting, we can have Ashley speak a little bit more to the Medicaid policy pieces. But um, broadly speaking, the 1115 waiver process um, is a process by which states amend their agreement with the federal government, with CMS and their Medicaid services that uh, govern uh, how Medicare functions in states. So uh, back actually in 2021, AHS did submit a, a CMS 1115 waiver. Um, we were told to pause on that uh, and resubmit one. Uh, other states had also submitted, and then CMS had done its due diligence and taken a look at those applications. Um, we are particularly interested in amending something called the Medicaid Inmate Exclusion Policy, um, which is a piece of the 1965 Social Security Act, which created Medicaid, um, which uh, directly prohibits an uh, inmate of a public institution from receiving Medicaid benefits. Uh, so that is why all states use state taxpayer dollars to fund their cartel health care systems. So we recently received approval um, just a few weeks ago from the Biden administration to move forward with our 1115 waiver. Um, we can talk a little bit more about that, but it would apply just to our sentenced population. Um, and it would restart full Medicaid benefits for everyone 90 days pre-release. And we've been working very closely with our partners at DIVA, uh, as well as the Medicaid policy team at the Secretary's Office of Agency Human Services to design that. And now we're currently in the implementation phase. So we do anticipate a go live date of 1-1-2026 for that, um, but still a lot of work to do on the implementation front. So <clears throat> two questions come to mind immediately. Why is Diva involved and why is it such a long time frame? Yeah, so one of the, I think, speaking to both of those pieces, um, you know, Diva is the payer, so they'll be very important for creating the claims system for processing that. Um, we also have to figure out a way to uh, pause rather uh, and suspend rather than terminate Medicaid coverage for folks who are incarcerated. Previously, currently in Vermont, um, folks who do not respond to those requests from Medicaid, from DIVA, um, to re-up their uh, status will be terminated from the roles of Medicaid and then have to reapply. Um, other states do use a suspension system where they just pause your Medicaid status. In Vermont, we have to build that IT infrastructure to do that. So it's going to take a little bit of time to get that runway in place. So for someone who's coming into the incarcerative setting, when does that pause versus suspension of Medicaid take place? Is that when they come in as a DP? Right. So yeah, there's kind of two sides to the equation. One would be the billing side, another is the patient side. Um, on the patient side, um, you know, you would not be able to access Medicaid for your coverage. Uh, you would then, you know, be receiving services through the healthcare contractor, in this case, WellPath. On the billing side, the state is not allowed to bill Medicaid for services delivered in the carceral environment. 
So that would all run through again, well packed. But we haven't built out that billing environment yet. Um, we'll have to use the MMIS system, the Medicaid billing system, to add certain codes that would allow us to start billing Medicaid directly from a carceral facility. Questions? I know Ashley would go in to more detail in terms of the DIVA side and setting that up, which I think is important for us to hear as a committee. So we can schedule that for our next meeting. Okay. Anything on the 1115 waiver proposed? Good. Good work. For more updates for you. Okay, anything else? Continue population. Updates, Jack. I think we have a couple slides as well. We can share with you. I'll be getting to follow eyes of this thing. Um, Dr. Rutherford, facility operations manager for the department. We do have a couple of slides. We presented some numbers. Um, I think I wasn't here, but I think the department presented some numbers on our detainee population to this committee earlier this summer, and it was of interest. Our fantastic research and data team has dove into those numbers a little bit more and pulled out a couple of pieces of information that might be a better picture of that puzzle. Um, so for historical, um, prior to COVID, we were running below 400 detainees, mid 300s. Um, up to high 300s. Um, during COVID, we dropped um, down below 300 uh, into the 200s um, and then fluctuated around 300 for a while. Um, and then I've slowly been trending up for a while, particularly over the course of 2024. As of this morning, we have 460 state detainees in custody. Uh, this committee is aware, um, but just to reiterate that the department doesn't have control over these numbers. Um, we don't arrest these people, we don't hold them, uh, and we have no independent authority to release them. So we certainly have a lot of responsibilities for care while they're with us, uh, and they have a big impact on our population, but these aren't numbers that the department uh, has any ability to, to change. Um, do you want to, I don't know, rest the slides? <clears throat> yep. You may be going into this later on in your slides, but... As of today, we have 460 state detainees. As of about 6.30 this morning. So that does not include anything with our federal marshal's mm -hmm. beds? It does not. That is just state detainees. And how many of the 460 are in the women's facility? Around 50? Um, That's been running around 50. That sounds about right. Um, I can tell you. It's about 50%, and I think we have just over 110 or so women this morning, so around 50. between 50 and 60. Uh, we'll get you a piece back. Just 47 female state detainees. 47? You're a little faster than me. So 400, about 420 in our male facilities. And what is our overall population ex- don't make me do math. Yeah, I know. I know. It's in Mississippi beds. Right. So we have 113 in Mississippi. Um, 1442. 1442. Okay, so. 1442 total. Minus, that includes 13 in Mississippi. That includes in Mississippi? It does. Yeah. Okay. We have 900 folks incarcerated. About 400 plus men. Yeah, so that actually gets us right into our first slide, uh, which talks about our capacity within the system. Uh, we've consistently, for a while, been running uh, above capacity for general population beds. Uh, uh, so the goal would be to have no more than 85% of those beds full. Um, we've been running at about 133%. Um, some of that obviously includes folks who are currently in Mississippi. So that is one of the ways in which we address that. Um, there are beds within the system that don't count toward that, specialty beds um, for folks with medical, mental health needs. Um, but if everybody that we had in custody, um, all the males that we had in custody were in general population, uh, we would notably exceed uh, and would notably exceed the number of beds that we have. So we, where do, if it's 133%, where do the 33% go? 
Absolutely. Um, so part of that is that Mississippi population. Um, we have some folks in Mississippi. I think uh, from a policy point of view, I think most folks would rather they be in Vermont, um, but that is, that is part of that. We also have some folks in specialty beds. Um, the challenge with that always is, are those beds being used appropriately? Do we have folks in those beds because they need that bed, or do we have them in the bed because it's a bed and we don't have a general population bed for them? Um, and that is always a challenge when we hit that sort of level of, of fullness is having that flexibility to put folks not just in a bed somewhere in the facility, but in the bed that's appropriate for them and their needs. So for someone that really should be in general population, they can't be in, in an infirmary bed or a booking bed or a close custody bed. That's what right. Josh is saying. These specialty beds are for special situations. And, and you're not going to put a general population person in one of those beds. Yeah, sometimes if we don't have enough beds, again, some of those folks need those beds, but it is it is that matter of that flexibility and knowing you know that somebody's not staying in an admission cell longer than we need to be. Um, that somebody's not waiting in in a higher security unit because a bed isn't available for them in the general population. Um, Keep going. Uh, so this this one is actually really interesting uh, and kind of caught me by surprise as well. Um, but forty percent of individuals who are detained, pretrial detention in the state, uh, provided an out of state address. They, their local address is out of state. There's all another twenty five percent where we don't have an address. Um, it's unclear. Not everybody, uh, when they come into jail, is extraordinarily cooperative uh, and to be there. Some folks may be unhoused. Um, some folks may have various reasons why they don't want to share their address with us. Um, so there is a sizable portion as well um, where we just don't know. Um, but that is a pretty large percentage um, that that come from out of state and being housed pre-trial in the state. So that 176, is that, are there any women in that or is it mostly men, all men? I'm no, I'm sure that includes women, yeah. I mean, men would be the bulk because of the bulk of our detainees, but uh, yes, that would certainly include women. Um, do you uh, have the age ranges or the, the ages of folks in that out of state? Yes. We didn't break that out. We could, we could try and see if we can get to that data point. If there's a good question, um, that wasn't one of the ones we broke out. Uh, this next slide, however, does break out another thing that we found rather interesting uh, and wanted to share with the committee is the racial demographics of that group are very different than the racial demographics of Vermonters held pre-trial. Mm -hmm. um, substantially more um, Black or African American uh, individuals are held pre-trial with an out of state address. Um, versus Vermonter. Um, I have no desire to speculate to where that is, but it was a very interesting um, point that popped out of us, or popped out of the data at us that we wanted to make sure the committee was aware of. So do you know if those individuals are being held without bail or on bail? Um, I believe that would include both both data sets that would include a variety of that's all our pretrial detentions. We didn't break it out. Um, is that of, able to be broken out as far as um, those two categories it, it, with with the uh, breakdown with the out of out of state and with the residency and and the race? We can we can try. I mean, the, it gets more complicated. Fortunately, the folks are really good at math, um, but. Yeah, we can try to get that out of point. But I think part of the challenge with that in the past has been that the bail uh, and condition data is actually the courts and not DOC. So, so, so there can be a gap between what we hold in our data sets and what the courts hold in theirs. Um, <clears throat> because we really just receive them from the with a mint from the court. To hold. So you don't know if they're being held on bail as opposed to. Um, we know for any individual person. Right. Absolutely. I can, you know, 
if Martin's being held, then I'm trying to figure out his status. I absolutely can get that information. Yeah, um, it's, yeah. I've just seen the the but, breakdown from DOC. That right. We've done that. It is it is a challenging. Our system struggles with pulling that data out. It is all manual entry with pieces of paper we get from the court. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunity for um, for either missed entries uh, or for the system to not read a variety of conditions that a judge can impose that might hold somebody. Or they need a new system. They need a new IT system. Who doesn't? I was going to say. But it does have an IT system. I mean, it would be interesting to see a breakout between Vermont residency and out of state. How many are held on bail? And how and we can, many and we can talk with the research and data and see what they can pull for us. Um, I, I'm always a little skeptical around that bail data just because it is not one of the best data sets that we have. Um, and we know that. Is, is there a reason that there are only um, two, it looks like black, African Americans, or white? Is there, does that mean that if a person is Latino, that they none of those people tell you what they are? So we do break out, um, we break out Hispanic ethnicity separately. Um, so you have some folks who identify as white and Hispanic or black and Hispanic. Um, we also have this, um, this other category. We have no other category in the state that shows up in large numbers that it's over five. So anything under five, we tend to condense because you start yeah. potentially identifying individual people. Um, there's no other race, racial category that shows up other than these two that's over five. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. I don't know if we have any more slides. Do I think that's it? You said the 1115 waiver. Yes. Uh, that was this real quick. I don't know if you have any more questions on detainees. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any further updates that you have at all, folks? Is that it? <laughs> Anything else from the committee? Yeah. So let's get back on schedule. <laughs> So what we had scheduled for one o'clock is some updates in terms of where we are with replacing the current women's facility with a combined women's incarcerated facility along with the reentry facility for the women. And also we wanted to get an update in terms of our juvenile uh, justice facility that is being proposed that would replace the old Woodside. So um, I would start with the guests coming up because they are in the driver's seat for some of the building pieces at GOC as well. And GOC can come up to the table as well, if you like, because this is a uh, problem. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Sabrina. So while we um, get organized up here, uh, for the record, my name is Jennifer Fitch, and I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Buildings and General Services. We get to come in front of you at least once a year, um, but just in case you don't know who we are, uh, we basically support all of internal state government. Um, so we support state government operations. We do that through many ways, but one of the ways we do that is through state buildings. Um, and we have many different state buildings under our portfolio, which does encompass correctional facilities as well as mental health care facilities and um, juvenile facilities as well. It's just a small carve out of all of the buildings. State House also falls under us as well. Um, so we are here today uh, to present on behalf or with uh, the Department of Corrections. And again, our job is to support their programmatic needs. And again, we're going to do that through facilities and a variety of other ways as well. With that, Nick, do you want to say hello? Hello again. Uh, my name is Nick Delman, I'm the Commissioner of Corrections for the State of Vermont. 
appreciate the opportunity to continue this conversation. I believe you all got an update at your last joint justice meeting. Is that right? No. Oh, no, we have a Starting from scratch. So, I mean, we're all aware of <clears throat> we're in the works of replacing the women's facility. We just need an update in terms of what's occurred from the end of the session to now and what you see in the foreseeable future <clears throat> that might be before us on January when we come back. So it's a real high level look at, real high level, not like it is in some of our committees. So my name is Sabrina Tarish, I'm the project manager. So we do have a full slideshow here, but I'll go through very quickly. Maybe some of you have never seen our presentation. Um, so this is the current, oh, I wanted you to say hi, but I just, um, but I'll jump in and then if there's okay. questions, I'll refer to you. So, um, so there's really two drivers to replacing uh, what is currently the Chittenden Correctional Facility. Those two drivers are age. It's old. It needs a lot of work and a lot of investment, and you're not going to get the right return on investment in that facility. Um, and the second reason is, is that it no longer meets the programmatic needs for um, the Department of Corrections and the people they serve. And so there's two main reasons why that facility needs to be replaced. I would say much like Woodside, which we'll talk about in the next presentation, right? That was construction of 50 to 60 years ago. It's no longer how we um, provide facilities today. We'll talk about evidence-based design and what we're modifying and changing as we move forward in time. Um, in addition to that, when it was originally built, it was built as a detention facility, not as a long-term correctional facility. And DOC has modified the way they're using that facility. So for example, adjacencies they used to have like the freezers right next to the kitchen, the freezer has now been moved down a hallway um, due to space needs. And so now it's not efficient, right, to go get what you need to then come back to the kitchen. That's just a very small example of what I mean around flow and how they've modified that facility over time. So this is a, a picture of um, the condition of CRCF. Again, what you're looking at um, are, I like to call rectangles and squares. Um, it's dark, it's confining, it's loud. Um, the women do have to climb up to, you know, up for the second bunk. Um, and they found that women were just not as physically fit as men physiologically. So it's harder for us um, to be able to do that. I know I have like zero upper body strength myself. So, um, so those are some of the reasons in, in which this facility is no longer meeting the needs. The other thing that I would say is we're making short term investments into the facility. A good example of that is the roof. We did have to go and do a roof repair and replacement, and we only did a 10-year roof, understanding that the hope was that we would be in a new facility, right? If we then are not in a new facility in a timely manner, we'll have to replace that roof again, and that's going to cost more money to the taxpayers of Vermont. So those are just some examples of what I mean around maintenance and making short-term investments. So um, this is what we call evidence-based design. The way that I like to relate this, and I know they say this all the time, is at least for me in the winter, I am not a ski bum um, by any means. So I don't really go out and do much in the wintertime. It's typically gray. Uh, we have long days. Um, it's been grayer and grayer, I would say, in the wintertime. And how do you feel? You feel kind of down, right? Because it's gray. And, and then in the summertime, the sun's out. It's shining. You're outside. You're breathing in all that fresh air. And you just feel naturally better. Well, that's what we're finding about evidence-based design, that your environment really impacts how you feel every single day. And so we want to make sure that we're near inside our facilities, that we're bringing in those elements that make you feel better. Um, so bringing the outside in, the more natural neutral tones, dampening the sound so it's not so loud, breaking up sight lines so you're not looking down really long hallways, for example, brightening the space, softening the furniture, those kinds of things, again, have an impact on how it makes you feel. So this is a picture um, outside to I don't know if we know specifically where this picture comes from, uh, but this is an example of an outdoor space um, that is incorporating that evidence-based design. And then here are just some more examples of what I was talking about um, with um, sensory boundaries, identity anchors, again, nested layers, kind of breaking up that space so it just doesn't feel so cold, maybe is a good way to put it, um, and bland and confining. Here's another um, example of an indoor space and actually with the new Essex Mental Health Care facility that was also under Tabrina as the project manager and um, the Vermont Psychiatric Hospital. Same type of idea. You'll see much of this um, replicated in those facilities as well. You're looking at that sort of softer furniture that we're talking about, about bringing in some of those color tones, 
Um, again, sort of changing the different heights in the room so it doesn't feel so confining and bringing that natural light. Again, so modeling after we've heard a lot about Scandinavian correctional facilities. So again, sort of they're kind of the leading. Um, we've been meeting a lot with Maine. Um, Commissioner Devil can talk more about that, but they're a little bit ahead of us. Um, and uh, this is an example of Scandinavia. Also, Maine models much of this as well. Another picture, again, inside uh, working kitchens. We have one of those inside of uh, the new mental health care facility in Essex. Um, so this is River Valley, uh, the Essex facility that I have continued to reference again underneath Sabrina. It's fantastic. It is a 16 bed facility um, and you're seeing both an aerial view and you'll see again, it's not long and rectangular because we're breaking up those spaces. Um, and the other thing that you'll notice is that uh, we have some outdoor garden bed space here, which is great. Um, and the residents are using it and uh, there's an amazing chef and they're learning how to cook with it, which is cool. And then you'll also see Art and State Buildings installation there, which is a program inside the Capitol Bill. Um, but again, it's to, it's to provide art um, and support artists throughout Vermont, but also it's another way to sort of bring in um, those sort of more environmental um, surroundings with trees and different things like that. This is a picture of the inside of the facility. Again, you're looking at that softer furniture and that more um, cream kind of wall color again, that's kind of more calming. Lots of natural light. Um, so site, I can see where you're, there we go. So I'm gonna um, defer to Commissioner Demel on site criteria for the new correctional facility, which we're proposing, which is a women's correctional and reentry facility. Um, and the program is driving the location. So Commissioner Demel. Yeah, so uh, for those who are aware of the work that's done at CRCF right now, you know, there's a substantial number of service providers who are, either under contract with the department or who provide volunteer services in that facility, more than any of our other facilities across the state. Um, and, and as we contemplated a new facility, we didn't want to lose access to those services. I mean, I think those have been really critical, particularly in the last few years, to the success of that facility. Um, and so most of those services are provided in the Chittenden County area or along the 89 corridor. Um, so while we looked across the entire state for sites, we did want to tether it to places we knew we could get services delivered in the building. That was a key deliverable for us as we looked at the site selection. Um, other issues that we were, were attuned to is we don't want to lose the workforce that we have, uh, and we want to make sure that we can take advantage of that. Um, and so keeping it in close proximity to where those folks live uh, was valuable to us. Um, one of the keys as we look to create a reentry facility is the folks who are going to be leaving during the day will need opportunities for transportation. And so finding areas that are connected to public transportation hubs or where the state could easily expand a transportation option to a facility um, was important to us. Um, and so we did kind of narrow down our look to areas that were somewhat close to where the facility is now. Um, and, and those are some of the key criteria that you'll see up here. Um, it's also, you know, it's challenging. We had a conversation this morning about geographic justice and making sure that there's uh, parity between geography across the state. It's difficult for our state where we only have one facility that serves uh, the female and, and women population. Um, so having it in a somewhat central place so that families don't have to travel either from the very north to the very south or vice versa um, was important. But knowing that for many families, it still will be uh, a drive for folks um, is something that we're attuned to, but without the ability to have facilities all over the state, it's difficult for us to achieve that objective. So uh, we did start with a statewide search. So we looked at the entire state of Vermont. Um, and we looked at both state-owned land as well as private parcels, and we did even more than what we normally do. So we hired uh, real estate firms to help us look, and then we actually also used Front Porch Forum for the first time, and it went out statewide. Um, and it was interesting. We got quite a few responses back, but we also needed quite a bit of land um, for a, a facility of this size and scale. Um, and the other thing we wanted to look at was also being really cost-conscious as well. And so if we could utilize existing state-owned land, right, then we can utilize an investment that we already have um, versus going out and buying new land, which would cost even more money to the Vermont taxpayers. So ultimately, uh, based on the programmatic needs that Commissioner Dummel um, talked about before, 
we then binned it down to Chittenden County and we found that we did have a couple of parcels, which Tabrina will go into more detail on in in the town of Essex. And so that is what we have narrowed down, Madam Chair, since we were at the legislature um, when it adjourned this spring. And we've been working very diligently. We'll talk about those things, Madam Chair, that you mentioned in terms of what have we been doing. We'll, we'll get into detail on that. Um, but before we get into detail, uh, I'd like Tabrina to give you a little bit more insight into those two parcels and the test fits that she's done. So I just want to add first, of the private sites we received, only two were in Shannon County, one also in Essex and one in Lowestown. So I just want to add that because that's an important um, piece as to why we ended up with these two sites. Um, so we did vet four sites, two in Essex, the private site in Wilson, and also our state-owned land in Virgins. Um, the Wilson site was eliminated because it was small. It was too small for our build, and it also had a higher price. Virgins was eliminated as we cited another state facility there, which was a better fit for that site. So this is what we're calling site one. These are in no. Um, this is not the right title, but um, <laughs> They're in a particular order. So this is site one. This is about a 50 acre site. Our facility would be located in this portion of the site here. It's about a six mile drive from the current facility. And so this is AOT land where the Cirque Highway would be. And the Cirque Highway right away is between these two charcoal lines where it says site area one. So our facility would be below that right away. So the Cirque Highway project could continue in the future. And this is just two pictures of the site. Um, neither one of these sites are, they've all been, something has been done to them. There's a pipeline going through here. There's vast trial. So neither of these sites are like virgin forest. So what we look at when we do our initial site evaluations, we look at location. So that's pro proximity to the existing facility and employment opportunities. We also look at site area, what, what's the zoning, you know, what's around it, is it appropriate? We look at accessibility, is it near major roadways, um, are the roadways paved, et cetera? Um, that also, you know, plays into, our, you know, where's the bus route? We look at hy hydrological conditions, which is your wetlands. We look at elevation, contour, slope, that helps us to determine how much uh, site work would cost. We also look at environmental impacts. We're looking at um, endangered species, endangered um, plants. We also look at developable area. We're in Vermont. We're not flat usually, so we also take that into account. So we also look at setbacks for that, and we look at available utilities. And so this green is good, neutral is yellow, brown is bad. So that gives us a little idea of, of our desirability for these sites. <clears throat> Site two, this is off of River Road, also in Essex. And this is a, oops. This is a little farther drive from the facility. It's about nine miles. And um, sorry, our facility would be located in the Baldus area in the site. There's quite an elevation difference between River Road and where our site is. So this is between the North Williston Road intersection and the Sand Road intersection to kind of give you an idea of where we're looking at. Um, this site is looking at the same criteria. This site does not have as many green areas, but um, we already own this land, so, so that's desirable to us. And I did include some more site slides in your appendix. So we've been doing lots of work um, since the legislature convened in the spring. Um, and uh, I do want to say thank you. We've had a lot of uh, local legislative support for this project. And we also have a lot of partner support for this project as well. So in addition to, you know, State of Vermont, DOC and BGS, um, it, you know, doing engagement activities, we've also been highly supported by our partners. I just want to say thank you and recognize that um, we have some of those folks in the room today. So. Um, so that's big and that's huge because it's one thing when we come, I think it's another thing when it's a leader within a community um, that steps forward to support what it is that we're trying to achieve. And so again, just thank you very much. So we have had engagement with um, the town of Essex and legislative leadership. There has been an announcement to the DOC stakeholder focus group um, that we're looking at two sites in Essex. We put in a request to the Essex Planning Commission that's specific to zoning. So the way that zoning works in Essex right now is the only location in the town of Essex where we are allowed to site a correctional facility is where the new Essex mental health care facility is. 
And so that would restrict our ability to, to be able to, um, to be able to site it in another location. There are other ways to do it, but it, it would be one more um, logistic that we need to work on. In addition to that, uh, the Essex Mental Health Care Facility is not a correctional facility the way that it's defined by the town of Essex. So it needs to be refined regardless, either way. Uh, so we do have a current request in there for zoning. And then we gave a presentation to the Essex Planning Commission. Um, and there has been a presentation, I believe last Friday I heard, mm -hmm. to um, CRCF residents. So there's been quite a bit of work. I would also mention that Tabrina has continued to work with her architect team as well. So they're continuing to do things like that test fit, to do things like update estimates and, th and timelines and things like that. Um, I do want to point out that the biggest driver between how quickly we can build a new facility is twofold. One is the uh, public support and the permitting process. That is always something that typically takes a long time because there's a lot of people that feel not in my backyard when we come to try to site an agency of human services facility. So that is definitely a big risk on the project. And usually it means time and time is usually equivalent to money. So uh, the second piece is the money piece. So this is going to be an expensive build and we will need time to, to what we call bank enough money for construction. We cannot build a facility until we have enough funding to do so. So until we have enough money, um, right now the current estimate is last year was around 70 million for this facility. It is gonna be 150, right now we're proposing 158 bed facility. Within that 158 beds is the 30 beds for re-entry. So that includes a 30 bed re-entry facility. And in addition to that, and I really appreciate Josh, I don't know if he's still in the room, but he gets bonus points if he is. Um, he is absolutely correct. We only want 85% of the beds filled at any one time. And that's because we need to be able to go in and do maintenance in the facility. And so that is a really important number. So while we say 158, you really have to multiply that by a you know, 0.85. And that's really the total number of beds that are being proposed. Um, and the last thing that I'll say before we go through the, the, the last bullets here is that we are um, recommending a combined facility, and that's for a variety of reasons. There's both the programmatic side and the service providers. Everybody will have more access if they're in the same location and service providers don't have to you know, bounce back and forth. In addition to that, it's more cost effective because we're gonna build out the center court infrastructure and that center court infrastructure will feed the re-entry facility and the correctional facility. So that is a more cost-effective way to do a build and she's got a, a site plan to show that. Um, but that is why we are recommending a combined facility. Uh, and I know I bounced ahead. So the remaining activities, sorry about that, Tabrina, um, that we're planning on doing. So upcoming public community session hosted by service providers and the Essex Community Justice Center. That has been another incredible partner of ours. They've been phenomenal. Uh, DOC BGS public outreach and listening sessions. Planning Commission and Select Board consideration of rezoning proposal. Planning Commission public comment. Continuing site analysis to evaluate potential suitability. If suitable and permitted, continued um, planning, <clears throat> permitting, and review. Again, if things go smoothly, I'm going to use smoothly as a big term. Uh, anticipate three to five years to get through permitting, and then capital bill request for building construction. Uh, capital bill submissions are due sometime in October. We will be working with DOC to um, make a recommendation to the administration to continue to fund the project, and then the governor will provide his governor's recommend in January, and, and then it will go to the two uh, committees of jurisdiction, House Institutions and Corrections, and Senate Institutions for consideration. Oh, Teresa, are you are you continuing to do all of the steps for both of those sites or just one of those sites? So we're doing those steps for both of those sites right now. Um, our request to the planning commission is to um, they the planning commission could limit us. They could decide for us that we only want you you know on on one or the other site. Um, but we are continuing for both sites at this point in time. We would like to continue that. It, it just gives us options. Um, costs will eventually cost and the tax, which is will eventually be what, what steers us in one direction or the other. And then I noticed on site one uh, waterway, I'm not sure what river or water that is, but I'm, and I can't tell elevation, but I'm presuming that it's up out of the floodplain. Yes, yeah, so both of these sites are actually very <laughs> high up okay. above okay. Um, everything else around them. Just wanted to make sure. I, <laughs> I, I, I it's very <laughs> Community yeah, yeah. 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 slide for site two, but for some reason site one is missing, so I can add that in here and, and <laughs> resend the slideshow. So 
how much money do you have in hand right now? Fifteen. around fourteen. Fifteen million five hundred thousand Fifteen million five hundred thousand dollars. So fifteen point five. If you subtract that from seventy, we got a long way to go. Just that on the table for both. So, would you anticipate kind of the first part of January, like the legislative session, to have at least some schematic design? And when I say schematic design for folks, that's your preliminary design documents that might indicate the size of a facility, the placement of buildings within that facility, and the cost. Would any of that be available from this legislative session at the beginning of the session? So we would have conceptual design, which is what you're looking for. We won't get into schem schematic design until we've chosen a site. Um, we have done that in the past for smaller facilities, um, but because of the size of this facility, the layout is really dependent on the site. Um, so we do have a conceptual design, we do have proposed size, and we do have test fits on, on the two sites, which we will continue to refine between now and the start of the session. Yeah. So I know that one of the conversations has been about where the reentry facility goes, where the reentry center goes. Inside the fence, inside or, the fence outside. or outside the fence. And you're suggesting that it's more cost effective one side of the fence rather than the other. Uh, no, no, it would be outside the fence. It would just be on the same site. Okay. Oh, oh yeah. That's all. Yeah, that's we separate. Yeah, not, that if we separate, separate to a different no, site. It, it doesn't make sense to. Yes, yeah, so you can see. So this is our conceptual design diagram. And this is just, um, this is the spaces that we need, their relative size to each other, and their relative location to each other. And so you can see that reentry program is off to the side and that you know where it is will depend on, on our site. And if we think of Maine and the national model right now in the United States, both their facilities are co-located, but, but separate buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, and one's fenced and one's open. Similar concept here. And so DOC is required to provide certain things to anyone in their custody. And so if we were to move to a different site for reentry, we would almost triple the size that we're planning right now because we have to provide an infirmary with four beds. We have to provide a commercial kitchen. We have to, we have to provide all these things. Right now we have basically mini versions of each of those things. And if more extreme care is needed, um, they would they would rely on the main facility to perform those services. But over the population, those things are very hard. There will be times, so because the program, the large programming space, and so programming means different things depending if we're talking about architects and engineers or whether we're talking about the Department of Corrections. So what I mean by that is space uh, to work with the women on different things, maybe education or maybe um, some other kind of job training. So that's what we call programming space. The women in reentry, there will be times where they will be going to that programming space, which would mean that they would be in the correctional facility because that's where that main programming space will be. And one thing, CRCF is currently this way now, and it's the way we build you know, facilities in the future. We use the building, as, we're not fencing this entire facility, and we use the building as the fence when, whenever possible. Um, so we don't have a perimeter fence in the traditional sense. It's just not needed for this population. So the living unit for the reentry beds is outside the fence. And, and with that living unit, they have um, kitchens, basically a full residential kitchen for them to use. They have a warming kitchen. They have education space, meeting space. Um, Within that reentry. Yes, yes. So there's basically versions for them in there. So they have all those things in that space. Um, they're really just returning to the main facility for, for things like the um, vocational program chain, training, which requires a large space. Um, and, you know, if they would need a more serious medical care, they would be returning to the, to the main facility. Um, and a few other things, sharing the same administration, things like that. I think the use of words is going to be very important once this gets further into the process because there's layman's interpretation of things that could lead to a different conclusion. So I think we have to be very careful to say inside the fence or outside the fence. Be really clear. So right now, you're still working with the town of Essex. You haven't decided on which of those two sites. There'll be more 
public engagement from the town. There needs to be possibly rezoning um, and any permitting, which could be local permits as well as Act 250. And stormwater? Yeah, yeah. So we got a long process ahead of us, folks. Piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs> I would just continue to emphasize any support we can get from the legislature is very much appreciated. And we are hopeful that our legislative, uh, local legislative leaders will continue to support our efforts as well. Questions, comments from folks? Chopper? The county local legislators that are there now, are they supporting this? They are. Yeah. Yes. I mean, you know, yeah. and they put out a public uh, message on it to that effect. Anything else for BJS on this before we transition to the Juvenile Center? I'll just close, I guess, our comments with two kind of data points. Um, there's kind of two statements I've seen out there as it relates to this facility that I think need some correcting. One is that this facility is going to be substantially larger than the existing facility. So CRCF right now is 177 bed facility. Talking about a facility that's about 15% smaller. And when you factor in the buffer uh, that we'd like to maintain in this facility, about 30% smaller than what we operate with right now. And so as we see those things out in the press and, and special interest groups are pushing those messages, I think we just need to be very careful about what we're saying here. We're not talking about a larger facility. We're talking about shrinking the footprint. The other part that I think is well known to this group, um, but is lost, I think, in some of the public messaging is the state could just take $70 million and spend it on things and that would resolve our need for any type of incarcerative setting. Um, well, one, we're talking about capital bill money. We're talking about building a building, which we can't use for programming. Uh, and I think that gets lost in the conversation. But two, uh, and you'll see on this slide, the department spends about $11 million a year in efforts to try to decarcerate, get people out into the community, build community supports. Uh, and so by the time this facility is online, we will have, in fact, spent more than $70 million on those types of programming. Um, and so I think you know, it's lost sometimes in the conversation how much the department really is pushing to try to decrease our population as much as possible, get people out into the community, bring community into our facility, help those pipelines back to the towns where 98% of our population will return to. Um, and so we're going to continue to talk about that. We wanted to make sure we raise that with you guys today as well. Um, to highlight that we hear that people want less incarceration. We're the first ones in line to say we don't want people in our facilities uh, if they don't need to be there. Anything else? If I can clarify, you mentioned the House reps had put out a statement on Facebook. The senators have not been. Oh, right. That's forthcoming. I just want to be clear about that. Although a lot of us are in support of. But like, some in the room may or may not be. Yes, yes, yes so. So it's still a lot of work ahead. A lot of work, Madam Chair. Heavy lifting going forward. <clears throat> um, a lot of discussion with the town of Essex. Um, and this is what happens when you try to site a facility within the Agency of Human Services facility. There's always a lot of concern um, and uh, fear and also some information that um, can be misleading, but also a lack of understanding in terms of services that are being provided in some of our facilities. So all of that needs to occur and it's going to take time. Um, and we don't know what's going to be before us come January in terms of how we can move forward. It may be a session that we can make some real decisions, but it will definitely be something where we have to continue putting money aside for the facility. Because I think the will is there to replace the current facility. That might and be a little bit of an understatement, man. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it is in this building. It is in this building and out in some of the community. But when you really get down to a community that has the land, it's a different feel at that level. We're hoping to raise uh, CRC up like we did, Woodside. It'll be a happy day when that happens. Yeah. 
So that's a good segue into our next project that BGS is involved with, with DCF in terms of replacement of the Woodside facility with a new juvenile center for this. So Madam Chair from BGS, you have the same team of two over here. Um, and then we have different partners from DCF with us as well. Sure. Good afternoon. Thank you for the record. Chris Winters, Commissioner of the Department for Children and Families. And I think we have a couple of folks online from DCF as well. You can see them there. Should be Deputy Commissioner Radby yeah. and our Director of Adolescent Services, Tyler Allen. Good. Good afternoon, everyone. So it's all yours. Okay, well, we are here um, to present on the Green Mountain Youth Campus. As I've said uh, several times during this testimony, Woodside was the former juvenile facility for DCF. Um, it was built during a time where, again, it was the prior uh, design and construction techniques. So center block walls, very hard surfaces, <laughs> long confining space, not an ounce, a lot of natural light. And it really did feel like I went there several times before it was raised, it, it did feel a lot like a correctional facility setting, which is not appropriate. Um, and so uh, we were fortunate in that we were able to reutilize that site for the new Essex Mental Health Care facility, and we were able to drop that Woodside building. So when we talk about misnomers, uh, as Commissioner Demo was saying, we see a lot of footage that comes out of the media that shows the old Woodside building. It's not there anymore, it doesn't even exist. <laughs> so uh, if you ever do see a photo of it, know that it's no longer there and it hasn't been there, I think, for two to three years at this point. And we're very happy about that. Um, so with that, that means that DCF has been left without having an in-state facility. Um, so I'm sure you've all uh, known. We did try uh, to site a facility in Newberry, but unfortunately, uh, really what our goal is to partner, Madam Chair, with our communities and to support positive outcomes for our communities as well as the state and the people we serve. Um, unfortunately, in the case of Newberry, even though uh, there was a court case and um, it was in support of the state, uh, there was a decision that was made to not continue to try to work in Newberry because, again, we want to be in a community where we have uh, supportive outcomes for all. That's really the goal. Um, so with that, we started looking at other options for the siting of a new uh, juvenile facility. And uh, the other thing to note is the capital bill is really full. So the amount that we can spend in the capital bill has been slowly declining, and then the demand um, for capital bill funds has been steadily increasing, which makes it very difficult to try to get some of these larger builds, and this would be considered another larger, more expensive build. So we're actually doing an alternative here where we're doing what we call design, build, lease. We talked about this last year when we came to uh, testify. We're using that model twofold. One is because capital bill is full, and um, again, we talked about putting in a capital bill request for DOC. Um, and the other <clears> one is <throat> speed. So we need to move quickly because DCF does not have a current in-state facility. So it's very urgent that we can build a new facility as quickly as possible. Not going through the capital bill means that we don't need to worry about accumulating money over time. And so that allows us to move more quickly. Um, and in the end, what will happen is, we'll talk a little bit about this, but we did put out a request for proposal. We did get many proposals um, from several different developers. There was a qualification process. Then there was a request for proposal process. There was a vetting process that involved both BGS and DCF. And ultimately, um, we landed in Virgins. We own land in Virgins uh, with about 400 acres, 300 in Virgins, and then we have a little bit. I think it's in Ferrisburg. Um, but in totality, there's 400 acres there. In addition to that, um, Virgins, and there's a video hopefully that we'll play here in a minute. It's just a beautiful, beautiful setting, both the community. I have to say, it's really fun. Uh, we get to drive around the state and Vermont has many, many wonderful communities. What I love about Virgins is it's this very close knit little community with this amazing little downtown. But when you say everybody knows who everybody is, that's definitely true when it comes to Virgins. Um, so it's a very tight knit, very close community, which is great. You know, they really embrace their neighbors. Um, and in addition to that, this setting is just absolutely gorgeous. It's it's wooded. Um, you can see the Green Mountains. I mean, it's just in Lake Champlain. It's just phenomenal when you talk about being in that more therapeutic setting. It's just perfect for that. Um, so that's very high level, and we'll we'll dive into more details. Um, but before we get there, we'd love to show the video if it's going to work. So fingers crossed. Sometimes we have a hard time with sound.
Vermont Department for doing very much. Sounds good. Mission of the Department for doing very much. Can we, can we play it from our website instead? Is it on our, is there another way to access it? There's too much Chris Winton. <laughs> Never enough. Come on. <laughs> Just wait till we get to Tyler's part. So the big, the big piece for this that's different, and it's just like good enough to play it. Well, we can go through the rest of the slides and play the video. Okay, that works too. That, that, that works too. I wanted you send her a link. She can take it. You have to be very clear with folks. The big difference here is we're not, the state's not going to own the building. Not initially, Madam Chair. Not initially. We're not going to own the building. We're not, we're not building it through our capital budgeting or a general fund process to build it. That's correct, Madam Chair. We own the land, but we're not going to own the building. It's going to be a private developer who's going to build it and own it, and we're going to lease it. So there will be an impact on our general fund budget. But however it gets negotiated, what are those lease payments going to include? And then do we have an option at the end, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, whatever, to purchase the building, to own the building? So this is where it's really, really different. And I just want to put that on the table because it's going to impact our appropriations our general fund because you'll be paying a lease. You're not going to be paying fee for space, I don't believe. That is correct, You're Madam Chair. Lease. That is correct, Madam Chair. So right now, um, the way that it, the RFP went out, it is supposed to be a 20-year lease, um, and then there's additional five year, four or five-year options to extend the lease, and there's also an option to buy at each one of those phases. In fact, REARC is actually adding who is the developer, who was awarded, um, they're actually also giving us an option to buy even earlier than that as well. So we'll have lots of options along the way to purchase the building, and it is our intent to fully own this building at some point in time. It's a specialty building, um, and we definitely want to own, we prefer to own specialty buildings than lease specialty buildings. The other thing I would mention is we already have a similar relationship with REARC in St. Albans, where um, they built a state office building on behalf of the state. We're leasing it. We will have the option to buy. Um, and they're also doing property management for us as well, while that building is leased under D3 ARC. So we already have this exist. That was not why they were selected. I'm just letting you know that we have a similar model that we've already done with this developer. We'll be using that same model in, in this uh, location as well. Try off the website. One more try, and if not, we can just provide you with the link and you can watch yep. it on your own time. <laughs> right too. It's like no sound again. No sound, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I know we had this struggle before, um, and, and this was actually a question that we've, we've received even from our leadership, like why are you doing some of these um, more what you would maybe consider marketing type approaches, and one of the things that we're recognizing is that, you know, through social media and the way that we operate today, people want to know more, um, and the other thing is, is that we want to be, um, we want to put our front foot forward, right, and we want to share our vision and what it is that we're trying to, to create, and that partnership that we really want to develop with the community and so that's part of the reason why you're seeing like we have a website that's dedicated to this project we have a video that we've developed there's other materials that we have developed as well we're trying to get out in front of some of that misinformation that gets out there the misconceptions about these facilities and um, provide information as much information as we can right up front to the community it's i can speak a little bit to the need for the green mountain youth campus i think you're all familiar but um as has already been mentioned, there's no facility right now since the demolition closure and, and demolition of Woodside. Uh, there's no facility within the state to take care of our justice-involved youth and the complex treatment needs that they have at the highest end of the system of care, and that um, creates stress across the entire system of care. It has a cascading effect downward uh, on other youth within, uh, within the system of care. And it leads to worse outcomes for those justice-involved youth and other youth experiencing uh, mental health crises and other uh, instability. If we go to the next slide, uh, Deputy Commissioner Radke and Director Allen can talk a little bit more to why the need and who will be there at the Green Mountain Youth Campus. Erica, I think you're up next. She on. She there. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Here we go. Here we go. Yep. We got you. Okay. 
technical difficulties all day. Um, just to talk about uh, in terms of who will be served at the Green Mountain Youth Campus, uh, the program is for justice involved youth. Uh, it'll be ages 12 to 18 and all genders. And, and really these are youth that will have complex mental health needs, usually uh, stemming from uh, past trauma or at least exacerbated by past trauma. And what we'll be doing at the program is providing a clinical biopsychosocial assessment and treatment in a secure setting. And the reason for the secure setting is often uh, due to some actions or behaviors on the part of the youth that may uh, make them uh, not safe. They may be involved in harming themselves or possibly others or be a danger to the community, which is why they are requiring a safe setting. And there are definitely two distinct populations that we're looking for uh, to house in this, this uh, facility. One is those that are really in need of short-term treatment and stabilization, generally around two weeks, possibly more. And this is to give the youth the opportunity to decompress have an opportunity to get that assessment, and then uh, once they're stabilized, move them on to a less restrictive environment. And that could be another residential treatment program, perhaps a foster family, maybe with a wraparound services, or perhaps even at home. And then the other uh, population we'll be serving will be those that need a, a longer term of treatment based on assessment, and that could be up to six months. Um, and then those folks will also hopefully go home or to another treatment uh, environment, depending upon what's appropriate given their presentation. Uh, hello to the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Tyler Allen. I'm the Adolescent Services Director with the Family Services Division. And I'll just speak briefly to this slide um, at, at a little greater detail than Deputy Commissioner Radke spoke to. Uh, when we proposed this, we proposed it as the development of a campus. That's why it's referred to as Green Mountain Youth, uh, Youth Campus. Uh, and when we have the two different approaches to the individuals we have come in, as the deputy commissioner described, uh, we conceptualize two different therapeutic models that are more appropriate to those distinct populations. So the first population are those at kind of the more acute um, point of destabilization. And so the larger program would be a eight bed short-term stabilization program. The eight beds provides us a little bit, bit more room to work because situations can happen, um, they, they happen in a moment. We might have three youth all of a sudden at once at a, uh, in a, an event that involves all of them and they're all unstable and they're all removed from the community and we need to find placement for them. Um, so there's a little bit more room in there. The hope of this program is that like the conversation we we're having before with DOC, that we are operating that program at just under capacity uh, so that if, if, if a crisis event occurs anywhere in the state, that there is always a little bit of room, a little bit of flexibility to move somebody into there at that point of crisis. I think the capacity to respond quickly is an essential, essential component of this um, program. So this could be for all youth um, on that side. Uh, the intention would be to have it very short term. Ideally, it's less than 14 days. I do acknowledge that there likely will be some youth who have complicated situations that we cannot figure a step out or step down solution within two weeks. But I think there need there will be an intensive process around um, how how are they placed? How can we move them back? How can we oversee who's in that program and how do we manage um, the population within there uh, relative to the rest of our community-based system of care? Right now, the state relies entirely on its community-based system of care um, to address these needs. And so there can be a little bit of flexibility built into there. But the hope is that this uh, more stable environment will allow our community-based system of care to kind of recover, um, recover from those needs. 
The second part of the program, and I see the cursor is close to that, is a six-bed short-term treatment program. And that really is a more, um, a more defined therapeutic modality would be built into that program that's designed to address those youth whose behavioral needs um, uh, indicate kind of a, a persistent and pervasive pattern um, that is, is doing harm to themselves um, and do, doing harm, harm to their, potentially their communities, their peers. Uh, so where we see pervasive patterns, sometimes somebody has a law enforcement concern, which starts off in one place that becomes more and more over time. Uh, and the hope here is for those people who kind of continue to integrate in our system from a justice perspective, that we can develop some program that's really specific to what Deputy Commissioner was talking about, the complex trauma underpinnings of, of what actually what often happens with this youthful population. So this would be a more intentional um, uh, program in terms of length of stay and what their treatment would be in that program. Uh, and so there would be they would be making progress throughout. Once again, these youth would be stepping down into other appropriate treatment settings as we're able to identify that and define that at the speed we can. The wish of the, the department is to utilize uh, locked settings as little as possible. And this is the reason that this, even though this is a, you know, it's a three building structure, this campus we're looking with um, is much smaller in, in number of beds layout than what, what happened at Woodside. Cause the hope is that we are not getting into an environment that we are creating bed space to warehouse individuals. And I think the focus of approach in both of these programs is about moving kids into our community-based systems of care as quickly as possible um, and recognizing distinct needs between them. Those two programs would each have their own house uh, and those two houses would be served by, or there are two distinct programs, they would be served by a common core. Um, and that is the larger third building you see in this picture. Uh, you can see a half court gym in there. Um, there's an educational facility in this concept design. Uh, there's an, uh, there, so the classrooms are built in there. There's administrative elements. There's a wellness component where they would be able to see with doctors or clinicians. Um, and then there's a public interface section of it. So this would be a place where they could have family meetings, um, so on and so forth. So there will be capacity for each individual building to serve all the needs on a day should they need to, but they will both enjoy the benefit of the common core building. Uh, and both the models of both these programs should be are going to be designed around peer supportive mentalities so that individuals are integrated into a peer support and kind of a community approach to way of doing business. And, uh, and, and then the, but there'll be capacity within the buildings to organize the youth based on immediate safety needs. Uh, we do have, I'm not sure what's on the next slide now. We, can we, so this, this goes, gets an evidence-based design. Evidence -based design, which uh, we went over uh, underneath the prior presentation, but again, same concepts that we have um, that we'll bring into this as well. Your environment impacts how you feel, so we're going to create a wonderful, warm environment that brings that indoor into the facility. So before we go there, I think we have a question here, Martin. Yeah, yeah a couple of questions on the previous slides. Um, so uh, the slide for that as well, I, I'm, I'm just curious, uh, the emerging adults age group, which uh, I've heard the 18 and 19 year olds, um, thinking of crazy age, is this facility going to accommodate 19 year olds as well, or is that going to be someplace else? Yeah, Erica or Tyler, you want to speak to that? I, I'm happy to speak to that. So the intention is to have the flexibility to allow for that emerging adult population within this facility. It's not a lot of space. Um, and we do recognize there is some differentiation between the, between the needs of a 19 year old potentially and a 12 year old who might be served. So this is actually part of the strategy and we might speak to this uh, at another time as well. Um, of da doing daily utilization reviews with the program who's who's operating here. One thing I didn't speak to before, but will be a difference between how we operated uh, with prior secure facilities is that there will be an independent therapeutic provider that is operating this program. 
Um, and so with that, we're, we've negotiated a contract that, um, that is, a what, what we've referred to as no eject, no reject, which means they need to accept any referral for the duration that the department needs the placement to occur. Um, and that is a little bit different from other treatment programs. However, it is a treatment program. And so part of how we oversee treatment programs is we do utilization review meetings. And because of the kind of elevated status of this program, this is our highest end of system of care, we will have daily util utilization review meetings around these programs. So that means we're sitting down with the programs, we're finding out what the overall makeup of the population are in there. And we're at times having to make strategic decisions around who is the best placed in this environment, um, uh, given the milieu that is in there, because we want it to be a healthful milieu population for everybody. Some of these considerations may be legal, as in you have co-defendants that need to be maintained some separation. And so we need to decide, can they be together in a healthy way that's supportive of them um, and allows for them the best opportunity given their justice involvement? Some of them may have to do with, you know, behavioral patterns, conflicts with other with other individuals. Um, gender might become a factor that is relevant in there. I think, you know, the, the example that immediately comes to mind, if there is a, you know, for an example, a a uh, young, young lady at, who's been exposed to trafficking to be in the same building as somebody who has sexual offending charges attached to them. Is there risk associated with that? How do we manage that? How do we keep the, everyone safe um, and provide the best environment for them? So I answered the question in this long way, Representative, because um, I think we will have some capacity to allow for 18 and 19 year olds to be served by this program, but we also will uh, look for flexible solutions in order to maintain the health of everyone. So not just 19 to 12 year olds, but other considerations, I understand. Uh, the other question is, because um, I don't deal with the Medicaid world and such very much, but the, the short term stabilization, the two weeks, is that driven by Medicaid concern, uh, considerations or is it just something else? It's not, okay. So it's I've not heard that in other in other areas. Okay, that's fine. I, yeah. I just neither curious. of these are Medicaid programs. Okay, thanks. Uh, it's an excellent question. I will just add, historically, that's Medicaid. The only type of placement they pay for is a. PRTF program, which is psych psychiatric residential treatment <clears throat> facility, and that's uh, so that that conversation becomes relevant to that come to there. So we have another question, Jenny. I have a couple of questions. Um, so there's going to be an independent therapeutic provider, right, Correct. within the within this uh, facility, and um, one of the issues that we face with Woodside were concerns about the treatment of the kids and so some pretty negative events. And so, and we're, I, we're going to hear from our, um, our youth advocate and deputy advocate in a minute, but one of the concerns that I continue to have is what are the, what are the guidelines? What are the criteria? what is in place to ensure that the state is going to put in place, possibly through the lease, leasing process, what is going to be in place to ensure that we don't see some of these same events again? And I know that, you know, when, when we talked, when Senator Sears was talking about this, this was critical for him as well. So uh, just how are you guarding against the, Devastating effect. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll kick off and then I'll um, I'll turn it to Tyler um, because <clears throat> transparency of what's going on in the program, how we're developing the program, is is something that's a priority for us. Accountability is going to be huge. The community is asking questions about this. Um, one big difference between uh, what happened at Woodside and and some of the mistakes that were made there that we need to learn from and not repeat is that the state was operating the facility and the state was overseeing the facility. So you can see there's a, a conflict of interest right off the bat there. State run, well, state I just want to interrupt that because it's not necessarily that the state was operating and overseeing. I mean, you could have that be, work out perfectly. 
But if you don't have the set criteria in place to oversee, then absolutely, yeah, that's what generates the the process. So I, yes, you go ahead. I'm, yep. I didn't want to interrupt. But that was, I did. <laughs> that was just step one. But to have a third party provider with yes. experience running a facility like this is another difference between what was happening at the end in Woodside and what we intend to do here now. Uh, but the lines of accountability through licensing um, and, and Tyler, maybe you want to speak to that. I think that'll answer the senator's question. That's right, uh, Commissioner. So the this program would be licensed as all residential programming uh, would be licensed. And I just would say that other residential programs theoretically also could have um, problematic behaviors occurring of, of those. And our residential licensing and special investigations unit has a series of tools in play that they're able to um, investigate individual incidents and, and uh, address them uh, and revoke licensing should that be needed. Uh, and this program will be subject to those processes in the same way. That being said, uh, we do know that there needs to be greater eyes on it, more uh, transparency to that process. I do think that there is a little bit of contextual difference in that now um, there are more people that have access to DCF's files and, and what DCF says, the Office of Child and Family Representative over here. Um, so they will have access real time to what is occurring in these facilities to some degree. And I think while their obligation is not to provide oversight of this facility, it does provide um, an avenue for transparency, which is vitally important. Um, I'll say even past what the OCYFA um, and the Office of Defender General might, um, might be able to do in that realm, I think that needs to be part of the conversation around what overall oversight looks like. And I think it is ground, I think another part of the solution needs to be uh, transparency with access to data, what is public data that is accessible. So that might not that certainly won't be at the level of detail where you will be able to um, understand what the individual experience of one in this program is, because that is all confidential information. But the makeup of who is in there, um, perhaps uh, the makeup of uh, frequency of restraint or uh, seclusive, seclusive activity, um, all of those things can be put out in a transparent way. And I think that also could represent some difference from how we have, uh, how we operated before. So, John? Yeah. a question about okay. if, if we're leasing, and I think I understand that arrangement, what, what, if anything, would we be in the coming session or the session after ask to put forward in the way of resources? That's a great question. Um, so we don't need any funding at this point. Uh, to Madam Chair's point earlier, what will happen is this will be a process. So when the request for proposals came in, they had to give us a bid on what they believed it would cost to build it at that time. And that was one of the considerations for selecting a developer, one of many. Um, and so there's that. So we have an initial starting point, but here's what happens over time. As you go further through design, they will continue to refine that estimate. Right, because their estimate's based on conceptual plans. As they get more detail, their estimate will also be more detailed. When we're done with design, we're going to do something called what they call a guaranteed maximum price. That is the guarantee that they will construct that facility for. And at that point, the state can either say, do you support that guaranteed maximum price? We could continue to negotiate to get to a, a place where we're comfortable in the guaranteed maximum price. Or we could say, you want to know what? It's too high and you're not willing to negotiate, so we're walking away. And then we have to start all over again. That guaranteed maximum price is going to drive what the lease cost is going to be. Because what's going to happen is that developer is going to want to recoup what they've spent on that facility over the years of the lease. So that's going to be rolled in. And then on top of that, there'll be other costs such as trash removal, different things that a landlord typically provides as a service um, to the tenants of the building and to BGS. And so you'll have your sort of base cost of them recouping what they've spent and then you'll have those costs that are included um, for custodial, different things like that. That will all be broken out. That was a requirement of the RFP. So it'll be fully transparent, eyes wide open on what that lease cost will be. And again, either the state commits to entering into a lease with REART, uh, the developer, or we don't. Um, so there's, 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 there's stop points, I guess, is what I'm getting at. And then when, if and when we agree to the guaranteed maximum price and the lease, then what you will see as part of that budget development process 
those costs will be rolled into DCF's um, annual budget request. But that wouldn't be for. We, we don't anticipate a capital bill request for this project. Oh, sorry. Yes. No, it's all going to, there's no capital money that will be spent. There was a little bit of capital bill money that was already put into the capital bill, and we've been yeah. using that for some, you know, preliminary engineering activities, but we will not, we do not anticipate requesting any more funds. But Senator, we are in the budget building process, yep. looking at a uh, placeholder for the first year of the lease for FY26, given we think it's about two years from now is when we would okay. anticipate opening. Great. Thank you. That's helpful. Sorry, sometimes I give too much detail. <laughs> no, no. Well, I saw two hands, Harper and then Teresa. Um, I'm reading page that says we ask. And it talks about we ask the state of Vermont re envision its plan for a new detention facility and create a new plan that is authentically youth and family center. It's just different. It's different. It's different. It's different. It's different. That, that's that's going to be coming from our next group. I don't think it's going to hear from our. I think this question, this question is. <laughs> Madam Chair. Oh, Madam Chair, I'm speaking. Get too much going on. <laughs> um, I think this question is appropriate for this too. Um, person who's intellectually challenged. Um, how, can, can you just tell me how this building and um, the program that's going to be in there is going to um, be wrapped around that type of a person. Thank, thank you, Representative. I think that's a, a good question for Director Allen. Thank you, Representative. Um, for an individual who is developmental or developmental developmentally or intellectually disabled um, or, or, or facing intellectual challenge, I think this level of program is unlikely to be our preferred uh, program for that population. Uh, we have concurrent plans to develop um, the current VCIN network. Um, I'm sorry, I can't think off the top, Ver Vermont Care or something. Crisis intervention. To, crisis intervention. That's, uh, that program to expand that uh, to better address the immediate needs of a, 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 what we refer to as a DS individual, developmental services individual. I think there's other solutions uh, that are specifically designed for that population. However, there may be individuals who have incurred uh, a justice response um, that are, you know, that that do have an intellectual disability. I think often the court uh, would be hesitant to apply um, a, a judicial response. To, to to a young person with that condition when 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 the behavior can be attributed to 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 their presentation. So I think this is less likely to be a solution for that population. Okay. Teresa. So uh, my question comes back to Representative Malone's um, question about uh, potential raise the age folks, potential older youth. Um, <laughs> And I actually do see um, some potential issues with, you know, 12, 13 year olds with 18, 19 year olds. And so is there any distinction in the space and how it's designed? I just saw from the overview, it didn't really look it, but um, with regard to age, you know, and, um, you know, being able to provide separation of space depending upon age of the individuals who are there. I'll punt to Tyler once again here, who's oh. on the uh, work group, or Erica, if you'd like to jump in uh, on the design process and what you talked about in terms of uh, Representative Wood's question. Sure. Um, I would like to say it's not so much in design process, but it's really more handled in that daily utilization review that uh, Director Allen was talking about, making sure the milieu is appropriate for those individuals that are there so that if we did have uh, an older youth there with a very young youth and it was an inappropriate mix, then we would need to find an alternative setting for one of those youth to make sure that each youth was getting the best care uh, appropriately and possible. If I may add, 
um, to that conversation, we originally proposed or conceptualized the idea of a campus to serve all youth. Um, we did include a distinct space that would specifically address the needs of uh, emerging adult population. Um, but then in an effort to really reduce the footprint of this overall facility, we we're really sensitive to um, feedback that came from a variety of stakeholders and community um, representatives who are concerned that too much of a campus is a problematic thing and for fear that we would begin warehousing youths in secure settings. And I think we're sensitive to that. And so we tried to we tried to come up with numbers that were saying, okay, how do we increase the flexibility of the houses we have to work with? Where do we set the distinction and how do we make those decisions operable as the deputy commissioner described? So I appreciate all of that. Um, and I appreciate that you actually looked at the potential for you know, a, a different spot on quote unquote campus um, for that space. I just um, I just think that we know from already what we have is current experience and what we are seeing currently that the situation that Erica just described is going to happen on day one. And so um, not planning for it because we don't like the potential impact from what the community might say. Um, I, I'm not sure it's the best approach. I'm just putting that out there as a as a concern. Um, and I, you know, the alternative is going to be for those emerging adults to to end up in a correctional facility. Um, and that's, you know, not as a policy, not where we are intending to go. And so um, uh, I'm just, I'm raising that as a concern, which you'll hear from us again during uh, the legislative session. And I just, this is moving along much quicker than um, the women's correctional facility um, uh, because of the, you know, the way that we're going about this project. And I, um, and, you know, I think that you will hear that more than just from our committee. Uh, and I um, am concerned that we're not really planning for it. It doesn't feel like we're planning for it from what I'm hearing so far. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just want to say the same thing, <laughs> except of course, it even further. There seems to uh, be a reluctance to be moving towards the emerging adults uh, that I feel from the administration, maybe not from the folks in this room, uh, and and not planning for it that doesn't make sense because the we it's going to happen April first and and I know this is a facility for a little longer term uh, but there's I don't feel there's a lot of um, energy to extend that date any further so I I think that that what I feel is missing is really hearing the planning for. 19 year olds, but also the 18 year olds that you're already going to address. And, and I felt that we'll maybe get to that a little bit later. I felt that that was somewhat the case in the report at the end of July, uh, which uh, barely discussed 19 year olds, which I think is the critical part right now. Any of that, I'll leave it at that for now. Well, raise the age isn't going away. Right. Well, it's April 1st, and right. I don't think that that's going to be moving this time. So. Right. Yeah. Well, and even with the 18 year olds, I mean, I think with the way the facility is currently designed with the 18 year olds, the 17, and 18 is much different than a 12 and a 13 year old. And, and I, I don't see in the design, the distinction being made for age considerations. Right. So this conversation will continue. I'm sure. And I'm just not sure where, because where would we be come January 1st? Yeah. How far along in the process? Yeah, where are we gonna be in the building process, in the programming process? How far along are we gonna be come January? So I just wanna uh, mention, uh, this is also a image, it's real. Uh, this is from our River Valley uh, residential facility in Essex. And um, this is a, a picture of a, a basically a greenhouse space. So I just wanted to, to share that um, and highlight that before we move on. Um, the next slide, uh, Madam Chair, you're always good at anticipating, uh, was our preliminary project schedule. So um, we are working, we've started working on the permitting process again. Uh, all roads lead to zoning. 
And so we have a zoning request in right now uh, with the Virgins Planning Commission. They're doing a larger rezoning effort for the entire city. Uh, so we are only one subset of that. And so we're kind of, we pitched our cart to that process, which will just take a little bit longer again, because it's an, it's an overarching plan. It's not just uh, BGS in our request. Um, so statewide permitting will move forward from there. Uh, there's many different facets that we'll need to go through in addition to zoning. So we anticipate that it will take about a year uh, starting this past June. Uh, drawings and specification development. So this is really kind of getting us to what we call, um, uh, what's the last phase of said? What did I lose it? Construction drawings, right? Yeah. Okay. Construction drawings, um, we anticipate completing in April. Uh, so that means that's final, like we're locked in. I mean, you can make changes in the field, don't get me wrong, but pretty much you want to have your design completed um, for the contractor. Any changes you make in the field is going to cost you more money and there's additional complications that come along with that. And then we also have specifications. Specifications are things like, you know, what is the mix of the concrete? What is the, what is the roof type? It's those kinds of things that really specify the building systems and the building itself. Um, and then we anticipate starting construction in, in 2025 and then anticipated completion in 2026. I will also say there is a stakeholder group that DCF has been, has been working with and traditionally, uh, as well as DOC, and traditionally Tabrina Karish as the project manager also sits in on those stakeholder meetings. So she's hearing and she's getting that feedback in the moment um, from the folks that, that they're meeting with for the stakeholders. So we are getting feedback from, from those folks as well. Um, so it's, it's, moving, it's moving quickly. I would agree that it's moving quickly. It needs to move quickly because we don't have an in-state facility. So there's, you know, there's nothing right now. So we need something. Um, and this is the fastest way to get us there. In addition to that, we're spending quite a bit of time uh, with community engagement and um, creating those partnerships, building that trust. Uh, so we've been, Chris and I have, uh, sorry, Commissioner Winters and I have spent quite a, quite a bit of time um, with the city of Richmond as well, getting to know each other. And again, we've had really good support overall, I would say from the community and from local legislators as well. Um, I will say that this is a community that feels like they have done a lot for the state of Vermont. Um, and I think that is a point of um, potential conflict. You know, we had, um, we had um, uh, the week school there for a very long time. Uh, the Job Corps is now leasing it. That's the federal government. Um, so there's sort of that history that is in the community. In addition to that, they have lots of affordable housing in, and they also have Valley Vista as well. So they feel like, hey, we've done our part and the state's coming back again, um, you know, and asking, it has another ask on the table. So uh, we're also having conversations about how can we best support outcomes for them as well as support outcomes for the state and for the people that we serve. And so those conversations are ongoing as well. So come January, you're gonna be well on the way for permitting if everything goes well. Zoning, right? Maybe. We will hopefully have a zoning decision at that point. So there would still be time um, for the legislative input come January is the concern. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, while we'll certainly have folks in for testimony and to review, you know, where you are in the process of that date, I think, um, I think the legislative intent is pretty clear about race, the age. And I think mm -hmm. that I don't see plans to accommodate that. And so I think that's, that's our concern. And so... I would wait till January before you consider those things, I guess. Is the and I would there. defer yes. to CCF on that. Yeah, yeah, we definitely, we hear your concern there. And I just do want to reiterate that, and you've all heard from many people last year uh, and the years before, that without this program, we really have no great place to treat justice-involved youth. So they end up um, with our friends in corrections. They end up uh, released back to their communities when that's sometimes not the best plan. Um, and so they're far less likely to get the treatment that they might need and, and deserve. Uh, so that's why we call this a crisis. That's why we are moving as quickly as we can. That's why we're using the lease model. Um, and of course, we want your input, but I just want to put that over the top of that understanding is that we are trying to move just as quickly as we can. Yeah, no, I don't think anybody, uh, myself, at least I'll speak for myself, um, not disputing anything of what you just said just um, the next step, the, the 
continuing step, um, the continuing piece of that process. Right. Um, that's just what I want to make clear well, my I, thoughts. I haven't been involved in a lot of discussions with race and age, but it seems like I remember that one of the <clears throat> recommends for not pursuing race and the age as was planned was because there was no facility tenants then. We haven't discussed it today, Madam Chair, but we have the, the Middlesex facility. It's a four-bed facility. It should be open within a month. So as, a, as a temporary. Yeah, it's a temporary. Well, I have another question. One that one in terms of how you define temporary. Yeah. Because I think there's a little confusion how you define temporary for that. But, yeah, I know. Could, <laughs> well, could I just tag on to that conversation? I think you've got a temporary. So no, good. Um, so, just to support what's been said here, my impression in the Senate Judiciary Committee was that the administration, um, at its highest level, was um, coming forward with the idea that we couldn't pursue raise mm -hmm. the age because the resources what weren't there. It? And when I asked at that time, would the governor be proposing more resources? Uh, I didn't understand that he would not. So it sets up a, a, a dead circuit uh -huh. where you don't ask for the money, there's not the money, therefore we can't do raise the age. But I hear the chair of House Judiciary echoing my sentiment, which is that that will happen come April. And I feel like there should be active planning, including in this design for um, the slightly older population. My hope is that when we come into the session, it'll be a different um, update from what we got last time, given that we've given, I think, three yeah. extensions of Raise the Age. Is it three or two? Um, three. Like, three. Three. Yeah. Three. And, and at this point, I feel like it should be regarded as, um, as settled legislation, and we should be paying and planning. So, Senator, you'll see that in it's, it's part of our budget discussion, budget and policy discussion right now. You have our latest report on Raise the Age from uh, July 31st, um, and you can see the progress we're making. It's not just about secure facility, and it's not just about money. Uh, but money is a But money is a and I unfortunately, Madam Chair, I have a unique of my own who needs to get to soccer. So um, I apologize to Emily is here as well as to Brina. Happy to follow up as well. I was going to suggest that we move on to the other witnesses, knowing that at least one person has come for the ways to be here. And a lot of what my concerns are about are really about the content of the therapy and the programming that will be in the building. And I know that's something DCF is concerned about. We're, we're talking about kids um, who may, may not have committed a crime, but they certainly uh, need support and services. So looking at the criteria and the guidelines for treating those kids is going to be critically important. Um, so I was going to suggest that Madam Chair, that if we could move on to the next two or three folks. I got one question that I'm not clear, and maybe you clarified this when I stepped out of the room. The four beds <clears throat> that are going up in middle set. Yes. When we say temporary, are we saying those four beds are only there temporarily until the Virgins building gets up and running? Or are we saying those beds are going to be there <clears throat> permanently but the folks who are staying in those beds will only be there temporarily. The, the intent is this is a bridge to the permanent facility, and then we wouldn't know. The beds that. are a bridge. Yes. So once the facility is built, the 14-bed facility, those four beds and the trailers will go away. Yes, for DCF. I don't know if there would be any other. But they'll go away for DCF. Yes. I just want clarity in terms of how temporary is interpreted. It, it was BGS's intent to demolish that building when mental health relocated. So we still we consider it a temporary building at this point as well. It was retrofitted for these beds. We are extending its life much more than you can ask in such a structure. <laughs> I just want to be clear because it's saying that I read an article that implied 
that the folks that are housed in those four beds would only be there temporarily and then they would go somewhere else, which is a little different than saying those beds are only going to be available until the other facility is built and then the beds are going to go away. Just want to be clear that temporary needs, those beds are going to go away, the physical beds. Yes, uh, at least from the DCF perspective, because the program that is uh, at Middlesex um, is also going to be helping us in terms of planning for programming at Virgin. So not only would the beds go away, the program itself would be moving over to Virgin's as well. There is actually already capital funding for the demolition of those structures. <laughs> Yes. Lisa, and then we'll go move to raise the age. And I know. We'll yeah. And, and I just wanted to point out what around the raise the age conversation, our, uh, our committee's budget recommendations pointed out that an additional minimum of, of $1.5 to $1.6 million in several positions would be necessary in order to implement the 19 year olds. That doesn't count any physical space, but that's sort of the programmatic support. Um, and we made those recommendations to the Appropriations Committee. Um, at that time, we didn't know whether the General Assembly was going to, to defer raise the age, which we did for a period of time. But um, I'm just putting that out as background for people in terms of what we took testimony on that would be required to implement that. So as the legislature, we have a piece in that as well. And what I've said right along, your buildings determine your policies. Yeah, how your buildings are built will determine what you could deliver. <clears throat> so with that being said, let's shift to rate CH. <laughs> we may not, we may still need you. Um, I have to go. I apologize. I'm gonna watch testimony later, but I do believe Tyler's gonna be here for okay. the CH. I know that someone's on a tight schedule. We do have a witness, Mike Manahan. Come on. Not Mark, Mark. Mark. Okay. Um, so if we, we'd also be good to hear the uh, child and youth advocate folks on both raise the age and the facility. So I don't know Whatever if that works. Whatever. If we have to move that. Yeah. 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 facilities, we can be as brief as necessary and then can hold up on raise the age. Because I know there's a lot of concern an interest on raise the age, and I want to give due diligence. Okay, but we can do both. And it's... So, Mike, welcome. You are an advocate for vulnerable populations in Vermont. Yes. So, it's listed great. So, if you could introduce yourself. Uh, yes. Uh, my name is Mike Mon. I'm an independent advocate for vulnerable populations in the uh, state of Vermont. Uh, I'm 31 years old. I live in Swanton, where I uh, own and operate a property maintenance business. Um, I grew up and in the foster care system and resided in juvenile detention facilities as a youth. Uh, 14 years of my youth was spent as a ward of the state, so I'm very, I have a very intimate understanding of these programs and how they um, operate. It's my, it's my goal to use that experience to um, advocate for the safe and effective systems and programs of care for these youth. Um, from the age of 15 to 17, uh, I lived at a facility in a uh, called Northwestern Academy in Coal Township, Pennsylvania. I was sent there for 14 days of treatment and I was there for a year and a half when there was a complete lack of step down facilities or foster homes for me to go to, which is a current problem in the state of Vermont. And it's a great worry of mine that youth will get more or less trapped and stored in these facilities. Um, my, my experience in the residential treatment facility was definitely about containment and not treatment. Um, it was not, it was not, it did not feel therapeutic in any way. And it's something that I find myself saying very often. It was just a complete lack of, uh, res, res, being a recipient of therapeutic services, I guess, for lack of a better way to share that. But what I, I was exposed there quite a lot to, was overwhelming violence, uh, restraints on an almost daily basis. I suffered a traumatic brain injury at 15 years old when I got hit in the back of, a, uh, of my head by a chair that was thrown by another kid at a staff member. Um, I had great concerns about 12-year-olds being housed in the same facilities with 18-year-olds based on just my personal experience in receiving a traumatic brain injury from those facilities. Um, there's a 
The staff can be rather vindictive and rude about things. Something that was said to us almost every day was, I'm going home today and you're not by the staff. Um, just again, it takes away from any therapy that is offered if there is um, any vindication by the staff, which, which can be difficult to reg regulate. Um, and just a lack in, of common sense in offering compassion to children who, again, are some of our most vulnerable populations. Um, and I, I believe that it's only compassion and therapeutic services that would break that cycle of then continuing on into corrections facilities and stuff like that. Uh, this has left me with a lifelong mistrust of anyone who wants to offer me with help because I was told this would be a, a very helpful, life-changing 14-day experience for me. And I, the entire age of 16 was spent in a facility. I just, I lost that um, because there was a lack of step-down. Um, and I believe that these compliance-based institutional style facilities that are being proposed will never be successful. Um, it's just, they, I believe that they may start out as therapeutic, um, but it was mentioned before, your, your building can um, outline your, your, your programs that are used. And so I believe they start out with good intent, but things can easily spiral out of control. Um, and like I said before, like things that a staff could say to a youth behind a closed door, such as I'm going home today and you're not. That could undo weeks of therapy right there. Um, and so I think I, I understand the state's need for a facility for youth um, of this nature, but I, I also believe that the agency has um, failed to demonstrate that they can appropriately regulate these facilities and respond to any problems that may arrive in these facilities. Um, I respectfully ask the Joint Legislative Committee to reconsider this design and approach. Um, I believe that it will be uh, more harmful to you and effective. Uh, thank you for your time. I welcome any questions. Thank you, Mike, for that. And I think you've been hearing <clears throat> the questions and the concerns over the last half hour about uh, the layout of the facility, what's being offered there, and also the possible mingling of populations that maybe should not be mingled and the age differences mm -hmm. for that. So I think we all have that same concern here at the table. Questions for my comments? Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Thank you for taking the trip down. Um, I know that we had some time scheduled here for folks to talk about Raise the Age. I know we're bumping up to 3 o'clock. Um, I'm open to folks delving into this a little bit deeper. I know the Judiciary Committee on the House and Senate side have really worked hard mm -hmm. on Raise the Age. So I don't, we've got some players already here in the room. Are there some questions or <clears throat> discussions that folks would like to have? I guess the question I would have first off is just when, uh, when uh, are we planning on meeting in September? And I'd rather make sure we're giving this appropriate time than try to rush it towards the end of the day. Uh, I'd be happy to hear the consolidated or our short uh, input on the facilities and then plan a, a, a significant chunk of time and I have some other ideas of who you might want to invite to that meeting. So what do you mean about a cons consolidated view? Or just uh, like uh, what Matt no, said. The advocate. Oh, okay. And the they family advocate won't, uh, as far as on the facility. Okay. But have them well, back in for sure. raise the age. Yeah. Uh, certainly have uh, DCF back in for raise the age. I would also suggest that uh, we probably have uh, Karen Baskin in as well. Uh, and perhaps uh, I'm not going to remember the name of the individual, um, but they did the report. They did actually work on the initial 2019 implementation plan, and they provided testimony this past year. Wow! Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and I can give you that name. Okay. So, Lauren, would you be the person coming up? To talk, or would it be both, both of the both of you? That's okay. We can be brief. We can be yeah. brief for that. Um, Eric, I know we had you scheduled and just to go over race the age. 
law, but I think we kind of jumped that, but maybe in September, when we have our September, it would be good for you to start the discussion on the ECH just to give us a review. What yeah. a date for September? No, we don't have a date for September. We don't have a date for October. Okay, good. So we need to do Not that today. So it's all the notes. So, okay. Before we leave, I'd like to have some idea of days that do not work for folks. Basically, I know Tuesday doesn't work for some folks. I'm not sure about some other folks. I know the week of September 24th would not be good because there are some meetings happening that week anyway. That would not be good. So we're talking really the first three weeks. We can get a doodle poll out. But if there are some real glaring issues, I'd like to know those before we put out some dates. Tuesday is still not good for you, right? I can work Tuesday. I might be able to stick Tuesday, but I've got so much scheduled that it'll probably yeah. 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 help. So what was that? Can do Tuesday the seventeenth. Sometime in September. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> you saw how the conversation kind of went. <laughs> Uh, okay, while we have some time, folks, is there anything in September that Thank you. doesn't work? Yeah, the 20th for me, because there's another meeting on the oh, summer committee. Because we'll send out a Google. Yeah, we'll yeah. so, Tuesdays look like I've like already been speaking a lot. Other than that, I'm other than that. Other than that. So what we'll do is Megan will send out a doodle poll. I would say the week of September 9th, September 16th. Yes, and September thirtieth. Yeah, sooner rather than later, I think, to be honest, to yeah. talk about this issue and the building and all of that is connected. Yeah. So why don't we just do two weeks then? I mean, we September, the week of September 9th, and then the week of September 16th. We'll do a doodle poll for that. And then in October, let's try the week of October 7th. It's gonna get dicey because we got the election. October 7th, October 14th, and October 21st. We'll get that out, and then folks can fill that in. But do the best we can. What a lot. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm sure we're going to dial in. I need to head out, but I'll see. Okay. Bye. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So this is a world that I don't usually work in. So I'm gonna leave it to Martin. You're the last one and daughter. So we have two folks here from once a director of office of uh, child, youth, and family advocate, as well as the deputy advocate of the same office. So both of you could introduce yourself. Yes, thank you. Matthew Bernstein, child, youth, and family advocate for the state of Vermont. Why do you want to be on the deputy advocate in office? So thank, thank you for making time. I think we have important information to offer um, about these topics. And um, so I'm gonna skip around a little on our PowerPoint or skip forward just in the interest of time. So um, our ask today and our message is that this is, we are at a real opportunity not to build a building, but we're at a, we have a real opportunity to re-envision the way we do juvenile justice in the state because we have zero we have, we have zero beds right now. And um, in some ways that is a huge asset. And so that, that message number one, it's a real opportunity. We need to think about it as an opportunity, not think about it as we must build a building. Um, number two, um, a lot of what I heard earlier, frankly, I would categorize as um, buy now, pay later, right? As um, no money up front. don't worry, legislature, we're not asking for capital outlay, et cetera. Um, but what I hear is a lot of costs towards the back end. And why that matters is um, what happened with Woodside, what, ha what has happened at every large, and I would say this is large, 
facility, um, juvenile facility in the country is it's outdated within, I mean, this will be outdated. If you do, if you build it, this will be outdated the second it's built. So if that is going to be the design, then we need to be planning for zero youth and we need to be planning for some kind of way to use it for the Virgins community. Because, um, you know, my concern is that they will be stuck with a building that's outdated and doesn't serve kids. And the cost will come back to you all. Absolutely. I mean, our estimate is that this will be this will cost $10 million a year. We are not PhD economists. However, um, the reason for that is um, we can't we can't this will be all general fund money because it's a locked facility. No Medicaid, no Title IV-E, federal money, 100% um, general fund money. And what we're doing by investing in this building over this long-term period is anchoring our investment in the deepest end of the system, right? And that is incredibly costly. It's not about how much the building costs as much as it is about the gravity that that creates that draws youth to fill those beds, right? Um, and, and to, um, and that will be very costly. And at that point, they might come to you and say, we have this building, we gotta, we gotta survey, right? We have to have this money, it's a necessity, right? And I think that the time to ask those questions is now. Um, so I'm gonna skip over this a little bit, but I think maybe this, just this last one, um, this, there is a notion that the thing we need the most is um, an entity, a building to relieve pressure on the system of care. And while I think that is true for, I think the limited place where that is true is for youth who are arrested and charged for serious crimes, like 12 or 11 or whatever it is now, or you youth, youthful offender and, and, and the order is to hold them. Right now, there is no place, to, there's no juvenile facility, so they have to go to an adult facility and they have to be sight and sound separated. And what BCF didn't mention, which I surprised, frankly, because it supports building a facility, is that um, the state of Vermont has been fined multiple times over the past five years or so. Um, uh, Karen Bastien can speak to this. Um, fined multiple times over the past year or so for violations of that sight and sound mandate. So, so a facility could support youth in that way, but it's a... Um, you know, we don't have numbers and I haven't seen numbers for how many, at any one time in the past five years, how many youth who have adult charges have been needed to be incarcerated in a facility at any one time, right? Because that's the measure of how many secure beds we need for, for that reason. Um, and I think that the doing that. Yeah, so I, th I think that like we need to be clear about why we are building this facility, right? It's, it's you know, if with more time, we would explain in more detail why it doesn't support children, youth, and families. And, and well, I guess you heard from Mike, right? Um, but I think I think we need to be clear about what our purpose is here. If our purpose is to build a building, um, I think that's a that's a mistake. You know, for the constituencies that we represent. Um, I'm hoping to pivot back to um, Senator Lyons' question in terms of what guidelines or potentially guardrails are in place to prevent another Woodside from happening. And I think I can be clear and bluntly say there have been no changes, right? So the residential treatment program regulations are the exact same as they have been when Woodside was in existence. Those regulations also have significant exemptions for locked facilities. They allow for strip searches, mechanical restraints, excessive use of force. All of these are exempt, which means would be allowed in these locked facilities. So that guardrail does not exist. We talked about a little bit about a conflict of interest. I think it's important to note that guideline or guardrail still does not exist. Right, DCF, while is not going to run the facility, they're gonna pay another company to run the facility. So they're still paying for the service. They're paying for the building. They're the ones placing the children in the facility and they're the ones regulating the facility. RLSI still sits within DCF Family Services Division. And we saw what happened as a result of that. Um, I just want to I put think, out, well, sorry, one of the problems with that too was not that the regulator didn't do their job, and I'm sitting next to one right, right here with Woodside. It was that the opposite, right? It was that there was not appropriate action taken once the regulators did do their jobs and wrote up. You know, the, it was the problem was not the knowledge. The problem was the notion that we have to have a facility because of dot dot dot, right? 
I think another important piece that has not changed, although there have been some advances, I think is important to note, is DCF's case management system. They do not have the capacity to track child abuse and neglect allegations, investigations, or regulatory interventions in any facility, in any school, in any regulated entity throughout the state of Vermont by facility. It has to be by a child's name or a family member, for example. So that is another guardrail that does not exist. And I think what we heard from Mike as well is the experiences with restraint and seclusion. They're not tracking restraint and seclusion data. They're not providing it as outlined in our statute to our office, although they have tried, they've given batches, but it is not comprehensive. And so I'm still very worried that a lot of the thematic issues that existed at Woodside have not been remedied. And so we are building another Woodside. The due process, the statutory um, language is the exact same, right? The Department of Justice already told Vermont, told DCF to re-examine its use of a secure facility to change the due process. And those statutes still exist. That guardrail has not been changed. And so when I sit here and I heard Mike's voice quiver, my voice is quivering, it's out of fear, right? We're building the most expensive intervention with the least, the least effective outcomes. We know that we are not gonna enhance public safety. We're not gonna reduce recidivism. Children are gonna be at risk of harm. It's endemic to the model. The US Senate just had this wonderful report that is in our citation, so please go read it. It's only 108 pages, <laughs> right? There's a brief executive summary. It's quite easy to read. I sent it to you. Yes. <laughs> um, so I think what Matthew said in the beginning is that we are at a real pivotal point to reimagine juvenile justice in Vermont. And I, I think we can do that. We have a population, even though the data is not always presented to us in a way that is small enough where we can do really innovative things and we can be creative, right? And that's where our office wants to partner with DCF to find the solution to serve the populations. It's not that we wanna be contentious to say they're wrong, it's that let's find the solution that's also housed in youth voice. I think when we've been a part of these stakeholder groups and we appreciate being invited and involved, it was incredibly glaring at the Virgins meeting, specifically the community meeting, where they said the REARC had been about a year and a half into the process of creating their designs, and they had not talked to one youth. And if we're building a youth facility, that should be where we start. The youth should be driving what the solutions are, and that's what I hope we can re-envision and use. I will say, if you haven't read the loss of grace story about what happened at Woodside, it's not great reading, but it's important to understand because I think it relates to your obligation as, as is ours to, um, to not let that happen again. Um, and I'll say that, you know, I, I would recommend watching the glossy video that we have produced. Um, I think, um, I think it's highly problematic, um, mainly because they, you heard this, the folks in the room in the video, if you watch it, they are, talk, they are speaking for the youth and saying how the youth will feel about this facility, right? But you just heard from a former youth, right? That's how a youth feels about a facility. It's not in, it's, it, 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 uh, you should not take DCF's word for that, I, I, I would just say. Um, we will do our best to continue to relay youth voice to you, protecting confidentiality and mm -hmm. observing, um, you know, all of the proper guidelines. Um, and, um, you know, even if, um, you know, the, the provider is great, the program is brilliant on day one, again, it is quite clear that this, this will be here for 20 years minimum, I would say 20 or 30, right, this building. Um, providers change, attitudes change, staff changes, right, there's a lot of momentum here, there's a lot of positive momentum, which is great. We'd love to see that shift to community interventions, which is what the, um, which is what the, uh, the Senate Finance Committee that wrote that report um, recommends. Um, so we're almost done. I'll just say, I wanted to correct one thing because we've asked DCF to take this down from their website, but they haven't done it. And I 
I, I'm not sure they will, um, but I just wanted to make sure you all knew that it's not correct. Um, and what the website says is that our office, um, so, so the first sentence is correct. We are independent. We do have statutory authority to visit residential programs and review records. Here's what's not right. The addition, this additional level of oversight, the person who educated me most on the fact that we are not an oversight entity was Jennifer Micah. Hi, Jennifer, um, who's the general, general counsel of DCF. And that was truly, um, a learning moment for me because it helped me understand <laughs> that that is true, right? Um, you're looking at 100% of our employees. Our mandate is all of DCF, right? Um, even if we were just doing juvenile justice all the time, we would have more work than we can handle. So we are overwhelmed every day, right? With everything we are doing. So to, to, to say that we are going to make a difference in this is um, it's, it's really frustrating. And I think it's really harmful in terms of your your status as a public body trying to get information about policy that affects youth, right? The safety of youth. We cannot do this. And so they should not say that, that, that we can do this. And, you know, do I wish we had 30 people in our office who we could visit every day? Sure. Um, you know, if, if we had one full-time position, I'm not here with my handout, but I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, you know, we think they shouldn't invest so heavily in the deepest end of the system, as we said. Um, this is just an interesting slide from a 2018 report, and it highlights something that Mike touched on as well, which is the issue here is not that we need, a, you know, a locked facility as much as it is that we need to improve our system of care up and down, right? And it starts at the community support level, right? That's the place to start. Commissioner Winter said something about how, um, you know, we don't have a building, so we can't do supportive services. I, I, that's not a direct quote. It is not the building, right? If we want to build supportive services for youth, we can build supportive services for youth. And again, we stand as their partner. Many of those are eligible for a federal match under Title IV-E, not if they're fully 100% locked. So this upside down budget situation here from 2018 is where we're headed back to, right? We haven't seen any numbers that resemble this right now. Maybe there are some, um, but this, this slide is meant to symbolize that we are, um, we are upside down on, on the way we are supporting children, youth, and families. So I think um, these slides have like, what else can we do? You know, again, we, we come across as just trying to uh, throw a wrench in the, in the plan with no constructive suggestions. We do have constructive suggestions. But when we go to the stakeholder meetings, we're being asked to, um, you know, decide on the color of the drapes, metaphorically speaking, right? Um, we want to redesign the system and we will be partners in that, but it is, it is, that is not what's being offered right now. And that's not what's being offered to youth, right? We are here to represent um, children, youth and families. So um, there's a lot more here. Um, there's the quote from the, from the Senate Committee on Finance, the risk of harm to children in residential treatment facilities is endemic to its operating model. Um, and so, um, and this is their recommendation. States should use the, their existing authority to prioritize the availability and utilization of community-based services for children with behavioral health needs. States have historically inappropriately overused residential treatment facility placements as a solution for children with complex behavioral health needs or nowhere else to go without investing in robust community-based services. This report came out last month. Um, I think so, what yeah, go ahead. to tie it together, right, is that we see the highest number of investment going into the highest level of care, as opposed to investing in the lower level community mm -hmm. level placements. And really, that's what I also heard DCF say, right, will identify a step down at the speed we can, which means they cannot identify it speedily. And that's what happened to Mike as well with his experience that he mentioned, that he was meant to go there for 14 days and he was there for a year and a half. And our office is working with youth that are stuck in residential, right? So it's not the residential capacity, it's how the system is working. And that is what needs the reform, not to just increase beds and buildings. Um, and I think I very much appreciate the committee's discussion about the mixing of populations and age. RLSI holds the authority to grant the variance to accept a 19-year-old or to accept an 11-year-old at this Green Mountain Youth Campus. And that adds another layer of a conflict of interest that has not changed since the Woodside days. I'd like to also address the raise the age issue because I think there's a lot of confusion. We're not going to go into our other slideshow, but um, I think the way to say it is this. 
the um, the next phase of raise the age that includes 19 year olds should not affect one way or the other, the youth that wind up at this new facility, if it is built or any new locked facility, because youthful offender and the big 11 are still in effect, whether raise the age goes into effect or not. We're talking about, when we're talking about serious charges, prosecutors can charge, right now can charge a 19 year old or a 16 year old with a serious crime. And either way, they would have to be held in a, in a youth, youth facility if they are charged for a big 11 crime. So it's not that there would be no raise the age youth here or that raise the age youth would be here. It's that raise the age, um, it affects other ends of the system. It prevents young people from falling into the deepest end. But it doesn't affect one way or another this this discussion from from our perspective. And I would encourage you to talk to you know Marshall Paul and others who are who are two experts on this. Um, so here we have our information, and then we have some of the sources here. This 2019 report, the first one here, is pretty interesting. It's it's um, I would say you know um, it is I would call it an excellent report. I would say um, you know DCF at that time really dove into this issue. And I think it really, um, it really has some useful information about um, what was happening there. Um, and I'd recommend um, taking a look at it. So also this last one, if you're looking for the history, um, you know, I think that was mentioned briefly, but it is, it is pretty intense that this, that, that, you know, the weak school in different variations and in slightly different locations has existed since 1867. Right. So this is like, this is the institutionalization of, people with disabilities historically, this is eugenics, not, not Nazi eugenics, this is eugenic segregation, right? This is segregating people who we find to be, um, you know, who we're scared of, frankly, right? And I'm not saying that, that this, that, you know, I'm not saying that that's what we're doing now, but I am saying that the, the fact that this is the same site as all those things that occurred is, um, you know, it's, it's significant and it really affects our, the folks that we work with, right? And I think it really affects the people in Virgins. And um, it's worth some consideration. I think the Vermont Truth and Reconciliation Commission did a great job uh, with, the, with that report. So I appreciate your time. Um, and, and we'd be happy to come back and dive into more detail on any of this. Thank you both. I'm sorry we ended up at the end of that. Day for this. So, so I have a lot of questions, but I will yeah. hold a lot of those back for now. But but I just want to, just one basic question, and, and I don't know if it's you folks or actually if it's uh, Tyler uh, to answer this. So what what is the anticipation of how many of the youth that would be held at this location are justice involved youth as opposed to youth that have been sent there through other processes? Think, foster care, for example, or TINs? I think that? that's a really important question, Representative Lund, in terms of what that term is defined as for DCF and, and also for the court. Which term? Oh, sure. Justice involved. Yeah, involved. Okay. Right? Um, I think what I've heard from other community providers is the worry that Chin's children or children in need of supervision or children under abuse and neglect um, petitions will be also included in this facility. And so that definition I haven't seen in in the paperwork that DCF has provided. So is Erica's on. Voice nice. from beyond. Eric, thank you. I can answer that question. I'm my computer is still acting up, but uh, for us, justice involved would be those youth that have been charged with the delinquency. So youth that are not, you know, haven't been charged with committing some kind of delinquency or crime would not be eligible to be a part of our, our secure locked facility. So somebody who's just involved in the Chin's case wouldn't be in that facility. Exactly. Just want to make that. Cheryl, on legally speaking, and I truly I don't know, but it may be um, uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner Radke, you know, um, I'm not sure there is any legal prohibition against that. There's the eight day hearing requirement that is still in effect, which is a whole other topic and is problematic. But I don't know if there is a legal prohibition right now from DCF placing somebody there. Do you right. know there's the yeah. administrative placement past the disposition hearing? And so I don't know how that is impactful. There's also dual involved youth who may start out in the foster care chin system and then may acquire a charge and may. You say there are potential around. loopholes is what you're saying. Sure. Yeah. And the, and the other reason I raise it is that you raised the issue of whether this facility made sense for 
somebody who was charged versus, I mean, that was kind of what I understood. I was, yes. Yeah, so the narrow issue I was talking about, it gets confusing, is youth who are charged as an adult who are under the age of majority and not be held at an adult right, facility. Right, okay. So I that is a criminal, that, that, that particular thing is, is definitely related to a criminal charge, big 11 okay, particularly, no, yeah. or you know, potentially could be a youthful offender, I think, but. Okay, all right, thanks. Right. Oh. Did you want to weigh in, Deputy Commissioner? I'm sorry. Yes, I just want to emphasize that the turning point is even if there had been a, a Chin's involvement, that youth would still need to have committed some type of delinquency act and been charged. It's not simply that you're you're part of a Chin's case. And does that apply to both sides, the eight and the six in the Green Mountain Youth Campus? Yes, it does. Okay. Ben? Here, not knowing enough about yeah. what I'm going to say. <laughs> right. but, but come on in, Ben. You're welcome. <laughs> so I know, just you have your toe in that water. Go ahead. We're all friends here. Um, in Title III, there's Section 5322. Are you, are you uh, familiar? So this is a placement of a child in a facility used for treatment of delinquent children. And it states that a child found by the court to be a child in need of care and supervision shall not be placed in or transfer to an institution used solely for the treatment or rehabilitation of delinquent children unless the child has been charged or adjudicated as having committed a delinquent. So perhaps that is the answer to my question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly what I was saying. Yeah. But right. the, and I should say it says it's used solely for treatment or rehabilitation. Yeah, right? yeah. it seems so, like there's some loopholes in well, that. Well, I mean, and it depends, you know, I think there was part of this conversation about the design of the campus. Should it be all on one campus or should it be two separate? Combining it might create and, the fact that it's not solely used. I would say regs change and purposes change. And if the building is going to be in existence right. so, for a long time, that could Then change. when was that law written? Um, it was added in 2007. Hmm. Yeah, so 2007. So same one. I do think there, there are potential legislative changes that need to happen. Again, I would, I would recommend Marshall Paul as, as the person to speak with about this. But I know the eight day hearings process had a lot of issues, including the DCF identified um, back in some of the correspondence with the Department of Justice that we cite. Um, you know, so I think that is another issue. And I, I really I just want to caution about the speed thing, because I just really don't think we are in the rush. I think assuming we are in a rush will, 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 will mean that we are stuck with the wrong thing for a very long time. Yeah, I mean, and I get what you're be, saying yes. there, Matt, but I think yeah, we also have to recognize because we don't have them in the room and that would be the state employees mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. who are the people right now, the social worker, case workers who are trying to stop these kids and youth. And so I'm just presenting the other. So I would say design. let's design a, a two bed program that is not the staffing situation. Part of the problem is the assumption that that's the alternative. Let's create a better program. I agree. Anything that's got the word campus in it, the last campus I was involved in, we closed and that was the Brandon Training School. Um, uh, last so, detention facility I was so, in, we closed. Yeah. yeah. So, so <laughs> this will continue come January, I'm sure, in the policy committees. Yes, and well, and probably next next month when we talk about Raise the Age. Yes, we're going to spend some time next month. Thank you all. We have a Raise the Age PowerPoint you can look at it if you want, but thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Yeah, we've drank. Not today, not today. You need a break. Thanks. Thanks. So thank you folks who were there online that came in. Um, we thank you from DCF. Daughter, don't sign off yet. Um, so that concludes our work for today. What we're going to do, Megan, you're going to send out a, I'll go over because some of those dates, I got to make sure I can meet. Um, we'll send out a doodle poll shortly. Hopefully by this week. I hope by, by tomorrow. And the sooner you respond, the better, because then that helps everybody's schedule. So for our next meeting in September, I think we'd start off the day with Race the Age issue. And I'm going to depend on you, Nodder, and Martin to really help with who should testify. So maybe if you could send an email to both myself, Ben, and Megan on that, and Ginny as well. And then um, we also will be doing DC, DLC oh, and come back for their rollout yeah, yeah, yeah. for that. So that's what I'm seeing for okay. our September. So, say the other part, I'm sorry. 
Gracie H. Gracie H. Right. Let the folks know, Megan, myself, Ben. And yeah. Jim. Yeah. And then we'll also deal with DOC on rolling out. Yeah. I mean, the DCF folks should come back and raise the age. They should review the budget proposal that they shared with us. I mean, if you want to know what what the investment would be, and they probably have an update to that. Right. I, I want to know as well if they're starting to plan or looking at what they might be asking for in uh, budget adjustment as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that's coming. That's, yeah. That, that's... So we're still live. Um, yeah. I think that is pretty broad what we're going to be doing in our September meeting, but we'll refine it as well. So if it's you could a, send a, you a, and a, any thoughts you might have, not or two. Send that along to us so we can get going on the schedule. Little anything bit. else? That's right. Anything else before we finish up? Okay, so let's go off of live.